Hello, everybody, and welcome to a complete guide to the elite aspects in Risk of Rain 2. I've gotten many, many questions about the aspects practically since I started making content. What do they do? Are they good? How do they even drop? Except for my item and equipment tier lists, I haven't addressed them outside of answering direct questions on my stream, twitch.tv slash fullygaming, by the way. So I figured it was time to make a dedicated video on the topic. Without further ado, let's begin. First off, to acquire these aspects is rare. Very very rare. Currently, the only method of acquisition, aside from force spawning them via mods, is by receiving them as a random drop. Each type of elite has its own aspect that can drop, so fire, ice, lightning, malachite, and celestine. I should note here that this video is as of the Hidden Realms update, so if you're watching in the future, then there very well may be additional elite types and therefore aspects, but as of now, these are the five that we have access to. Upon killing any elite monster, they have a 0.05% chance to drop the respective aspect on death. Not 5%, not 0.5%, but 0.05%. Those odds are extremely low. For every 5,000 elites you kill, you will on average receive one aspect. That's so rare that I bet plenty of you said, whoa, I didn't even know these things existed in the first place. I haven't seen them at all. In fact, they're so uncommon that you cannot rely on them dropping. Maybe with some reds like clovers, you can hope to see one during a given run, but these aspects, no. I had to force spawn the aspects in the background footage you're watching because out of the past 25 streams I've done, I've had zero aspects to drop. Speaking of clovers though, interestingly enough, having 57 leaf clovers does increase the chance of the aspects dropping. Refer to the formula of the clover to see how much it impacts their drop rate, but it's safe to say that it will drastically increase your odds of receiving one. All right, all right, they're rare. Okay, we get it, Mr. Streamer. If they're that rare, they must be pretty good though, right? Uh, right? Well, uh, funny you should mention that. Did I forget to tell you that they kind of occupy your equipment slot and that they are purely passive benefits and do not have an active component at all? Yeah, the elite aspects are essentially equipment that behave like an item would. There are no active effects on any of them and they take up your equipment slot, meaning you won't be able to use a prion, capacitor, tonic, etc. if you choose to run with an aspect. To determine whether or not this trade-off is worth it, let's go over what the aspects actually do. As stated, each elite monster has a 0.05% chance to drop their respective aspect on death. And as you may expect, these aspects simply turn you into that elite type. Here's a quick overview. Fire aspect gives you a burn on your attacks and some fire damage via a trail when you move. Note that this trail does not inflict ignite. It simply deals damage as long as the enemy is on it. Ice aspect makes your attack slow on hit and when you die, you leave a huge ice explosion that damages and freezes enemies, which uh, its on death effectiveness is quite limited to say the least. The lightning aspect turns half of your HP into shields and gives your hits, both items and abilities, lightning bombs that deal half of the original hits value as extra AOE damage. Malachite aspects give you the big urchin bombs that fly out occasionally, as well as negating all enemy healing with your hits. And finally, the Celestine aspect gives you an even longer and larger slow on hit compared to the ice aspect and makes your allies invisible within a certain radius. Now, to go more in depth, let's start with the aspect aspects that are pretty self-explanatory. There's nothing special about the Malachite aspect. While negating healing is very strong versus you, it's not nearly as effective on monsters. Very few monsters have any form of healing with the obvious exception of a scavenger with foreign fruit, wood sprite, reduve racks, med kits, or something like that. The Malachite aspect would be pretty useful then, but outside of that specific scenario, its effect is pretty much useless. Celestine is also lackluster. The slow on hit is just a stronger chrono bubble. That's it. And I'll say it as I do every time when talking talking about slows. They solely affect movement speed and nothing else. If slows affected all actions, such as animation and projectile speeds, they would be extremely useful. Since they do not, however, all the Celestine aspect does is provide you with an uber chrono bobble and an area of invisibility for your allies. Hold on, you may be saying, if my allies are invisible, does that mean things like my drones, beetle guards, and engineer turrets cannot be seen by anything? Isn't that ridiculously OP? Yes, except it doesn't change your allies' interactions with enemies at all. In my testing, drones, minions, turrets, you name it, functioned exactly the same inside the zone as they would outside of it. The invisibility did nothing for hiding them from enemies as literally everything could see them as usual. It appears the Celestine invisibility is not a permanent Old War stealth kit for your allies, meaning all in all, the Celestine aspect is a chrono bobble. With the ice aspect, again, it's a chrono bobble with the added effect of attempting to avenge you on death with its explosion. I, uh, I don't think I need to explain why doing 
something after you have already died isn't very useful, right? So that leaves us with the fire and lightning aspects. Thankfully, these are a bit more interesting and have some broader uses. In the case of the fire aspect, the focus is on the burn it grants your hits and not the trail of damage you leave in your way. Again, the trail does not stack burns like your hits. How the burn applies is easy enough. Every hit you deal adds a stack of burn to the target. Each stack has a duration of four seconds, which is affected by proc coefficient, and the duration is separate for each stack of burn that you apply. This means while the per tick damage of the burn does go up the more you hit a target, once the initial stack's time has expired, its damage is removed from that total burn's pool. You can't endlessly refresh the duration. However, the actual damage the burn does is a little more convoluted than its application. I tested the fire aspect for 30 minutes straight, throwing any and all test scenarios that I could think of at it, and I just could not determine how its damage is scaled. Thankfully, our boy Harb came to the rescue once again. Thank you as usual, my good sir. The fire aspect's damage is calculated as follows. Ticking five times per second, each tick of damage deals the smaller amount between 1% of the target's max HP and shields, or 10% of the attacker's damage. Note that the attacker's damage is your base damage and not the overall damage of your hit that procced the burn. Meaning you can have a preon accumulator which procs an ATG, but that burn's damage will be exactly the same as if you had only used your primary attack in the first place. Now, okay, how does this formula apply in game? How good is the scaling of 1% of the target's HP or 10% of your base damage? Because the burn chooses the lower value between the two, the scaling potential of its damage is also quite low. Yes, in the early game, you will absolutely feel the power of it, but once you get even just a few stages into a run, its damage starts to become insignificant. Take this example of me fighting some bosses. In the first clip, each stack of the burn ticks for two damage, which is exactly 1% of the target's HP. This is because my base damage is the higher value between the two. Remember that the burn chooses the lower value. In the next clip, each stack of the burn ticks for five damage, which is equal to 10% of my base damage, because 1% of the target's HP would be significantly higher than that amount. Now, you may be saying here, well, if your base damage was higher from shaped glass or spinal tonic, oh wait, you can't use the tonic anymore because it takes your equipment slot. Well, if you had some shaped glass, the burn would be dealing damage based off of the target's max HP and a minimum of 5% per second, which sounds pretty OP to me. Okay, here's what killing a similar boss looks like having just a few stacks of shaped glass. Okay, not too bad. It's definitely dealing some nice damage for sure. 5% of the target's HP, but oh wait, I literally have no other items. Let's see what this looks like when I actually have some other items on top of the burn. Hmm, how much damage did the burn do versus how much everything else did? Maybe 10%, 15% if I'm being generous. And it's not like I went crazy overboard with the items here either. No reds, pretty good crit chance, a few syringes, ukuleles, and ATGs. Nothing too fancy at all. Add some more items into the mix and it would be even clearer that once you get some items going in a run, the amount of damage the burn provides you is very insignificant to your overall DPS. The point is that the fire damage does not scale well at all, period. It's not like Acrid's Poison, which always at a bare minimum will be dealing damage based off of the target's HP. If you're fighting a super tanky enemy, the burn is going to scale off of your base damage because it will undoubtedly be the lower value between the two. And even if you get to a point where your base damage is significantly higher than the 1% HP, then your items will be blowing everything up in an instant anyway. The burn would be irrelevant, especially when you consider taking another equipment in its place. Add in the little cherry on top of the aspect taking away your equipment slot, and there is no justification for taking the fire aspect in any situation outside of the early game. But hey, remember that drop chance? Yeah, you're not going to be getting this thing early on into a run anyway. So the conclusion, fire aspect is not worth it. Finally, let's talk about the lightning aspect. To put it bluntly, it is definitely stronger than fire, but is still not worth the trade-offs. The effects of the fire and lightning aspects are not too different in their theme. For each hit you deal, there will be some additional damage occurring after a period of time. Simple as that. The difference with the lightning aspect is twofold. First, its damage is not instant and rather in time bomb with a pretty short fuse. Its damage is based off of your total damage, as in the higher the damage of the hit, the higher the damage of the lightning bomb. Also, the bomb deals damage in an area similar to that of the artificer's plasma 
reasonable, which is actually a decent sized area. The second difference is that upon pickup, half of your HP is converted into shields permanently, at least for as long as you're holding the aspect. So right off of the bat, the lighting aspect seems promising, at least in the damage department. If you've been looking at the background footage for any period of time, you'd see that it's dealing quite a significant chunk of my overall damage to any target. Determining the overall output of the bombs is much easier than the burn of the fire aspect as well. Each orb of lightning deals 50% of the hits damage. Simple as that. Even if that hit is a critical strike, the bomb will always deal 50% of the total value of the hit, period. Take this example on Huntress, where I first attack with no crit and then with capped crit. Both times, the orb deals exactly 50% of the ballista's damage, despite also having the crit damage text. There are no double dipping shenanigans with crits. That's the point. Interestingly, proc coefficient has no effect on the bombs at all. Normally, proc coefficient would affect an on-hit item in some way, whether it be the duration for damage over time, the size of the area for AOE damage, and simply the damage value otherwise. Nope, with lightning orbs, every single hit from every single item and attack will proc an orb that deals 50% of the damage. However, it is important to note that the damage fall off, such as with commandos attacks, does affect how much damage the orb will do. It's all about the value of the hit. The lower the hit's damage, the lower the orb's damage. Hmm, this seems pretty good on paper. If anything, it's essentially a slightly weaker version of a behemoth, right? 50% more damage across pretty much everything. To me, its trade-offs come in the same context as the fire aspect. It's good early on, especially when you have little to no damage items in the first place, but the longer the run goes, the less and less impactful the lightning bombs become. And uh, remember that drop rate again? Yeah, you're not seeing it early on. Think of it like this, and warning, we're about to get math heavy. Let's say you have a lightning aspect plus three ATGs, and the hit which procs the ATG deals 500 damage. This is an entirely hypothetical number, and the reason I chose it is because most non-equipment hits around this time would deal deals somewhere near this ballpark of damage around 30 or 40 minutes into a run. Note that we get an orb from both the hit itself and the ATG's impact. So the hit dealt 500 damage and the orb from that hit deals an additional 250. Then the three stack ATG deals 900% of the original 500, which is 4,500. And then we get another orb from the ATG, which deals an additional 2,250. In that very short example, we received an additional 2,500 damage from having the lightning aspect and our total damage damage was 7,500. Remember that the lightning aspect, as with all the others, is taking up the equipment slot. So we must now compare it versus the options in its place. Let's use the same example now without the lightning aspect and instead having a royal capacitor in its place. It's safe to say that whatever ability did 500 damage before, the capacitor would deal significantly more damage than it. But to play it safe, let's just say that the capacitor only deals three times the amount. Our initial hit now deals 1,500 damage. The three stack ATG procs and deals 900% damage, which equates to 13,500 damage. Our total damage in this scenario is 15,000. You may be saying, wait, we tripled the original hits damage, but ended up only dealing double the overall damage. Isn't that a sign of the lightning orb scaling better? No. Again, these were purely hypothetical examples, and I definitely played it on the safe side with the numbers, as in I gave the lightning aspect much more of a chance than it would likely have gotten in the context of a real run. I'm not going to sit here and crunch endless amounts of hypothetical numbers numbers to reach hypothetical results when the context of what goes on in a run is simply too vast to ever completely cover without massive amounts of real concrete samples. Here, personal experience is by far the best way to determine what will likely happen across many, many runs, and given my experience, scaling your overall damage through higher initial hit values is much more impactful than simply scaling the rate of hitting things period. And that is why I also believe the lighting aspect to not be worth the equipment slot it takes up. All in all, there you have it. A complete explanation of all the elite aspects in the game. What are your thoughts? Think Overloaded Multi is the best survivor in the game and deals equivalent damage to a prey on accumulator per hit? Let me know in the comments below. Consider leaving a like or dislike on the video depending on whether or not I wasted your time here. Hopefully not. Again, you could check out my stream over at twitch.tv slash woollygaming and also join our Discord server if you'd like notifications when I upload a new video here or go live on Twitch. Thank you for watching, and I gotta go continue the one run challenge, so wish me luck.